The 1980s and 90s turned Wimbledon from a refined sport to the modern power game we see today. Great rivalries ritualized every summer. Technology revolutionized tennis. And center court became a dueling ground between its greatest champions. Each one required someone else to just help them go that extra stage further and be that little bit better. Ultimately, they're better for the existence of the other because it sort of becomes this benchmark. It sort of becomes context. You just wondered how long the players could go on playing this extraordinary level of tennis. Unbelievable shot. I think the whole world was waiting for us to play. And um, for me to, uh, to play John was something special. By the summer of 1980, something was needed to lift our spirits. Riots and demonstrations were a common sight around Britain, as the country struggled with a new era of austerity under the Conservative government of Margaret Thatcher. The ladies not for turning. At Wimbledon, the weather seemed to reflect the mood. It was one of the wettest tournaments on record. Out of the gloom, though, emerged one of the greatest matches in Wimbledon history, a drama of compelling intensity that defined two careers and changed tennis forever. More than 30 years on, it's difficult to distinguish truth from myth. But when Bjorn Borg sank to his knees at 6.11 on the 5th of July, 1980, tennis had become a modern sport, celebrity-driven, youthful, and glamorous. I think we did a lot for tennis in Germany. The interest, the impact of our match, uh, not only here at Wimbledon, but all over the world. As the first tennis rock star, Borg led the way. He was a symbol of the flower power generation, attracting a new young audience to the conservative confines of the All England Club. Wimbledon, I think, prefers to keep things, on, for the most part, relatively low-key. And Borg shook it up, without a doubt. And just suddenly you had screaming girls hammering on the side of, of the court, clamoring for this, this guy. But Borg's personality didn't match his looks. He was reserved, boring even. But he just kept winning. Four straight Wimbledon titles coming into the 80 final. my favorite tennis player of all time. You know, the cool Swede would sort of waddle in there with the big shoulders and the little waist with the headband, say nothing, just go through the game, play it, and then beat everybody to a pole. I think those who used to sit at home on a men's and women's finals day and it was perceived that women was watched by perhaps mothers and fathers and grandparents, suddenly it was watched by kids who were leaping up and down, looking at this, this kid with, with long blonde hair who was um, in this, this, this new sensation. It was only when a true rebel, a New Yorker through and through with plenty to say for himself, appeared across the net 
Did Borg's character gain the contrast it so badly needed? Well, that's... Oh, well, no, no, no. The call came before the ball was played. He never even called? He would just go crazy. You, you, just, you never knew what was going to happen. You knew he was going to lose it at some point. He never said anything. He called a ball. He didn't call a ball. He just went like that. And he called a ball. He played like this. Most people found his behavior objectionable when he was a young man. The way he would always query line decisions and argue with officials and stamp his foot as if he was the only person who mattered. Mr. McEnroe, you are getting a public warning. Now, please play on. Keep your mouth shut out here. I like the referee out here. I think fans were often sort of very conflicted in their feelings. They loved the player and how he performed, and they didn't always like the behavior. So there, there were times that they were very torn, but he could win them back with his play. He was a beautiful player to watch, that service motion, that serve and volley game, you know, it was just spectacular. This incredibly talented guy with hands like butter, I mean, it was beautiful volleys. I mean, no one could make anyone's hands softer than McEnroe at the net. As 2 p.m. approached on finals day in 1980, the world had been drawn into the drama. Their contrasts in personality made for a perfect rivalry. The ice school favorite versus the hothead challenger. To play John was something special because we played a lot of time previous before the final and all the matches we played was very close matches. So I was looking forward to, to play him and I knew that John wanted to beat me really badly. You know, I figured that my game was well suited to play his at Wimbledon. And so I was very excited about it. Uh, I felt like I was, uh, my time had come. And so it seemed, as McEnroe took the opening set 6-1 in just 26 minutes. Yeah, that's that's it. That's it. Tennis, it is said, is like boxing without gloves. And just like the boxing ring, great rivalries lift the sport into the realms of theatre, allowing character to be revealed and narrative to be built. And there is no bigger stage than the finals day on Centre Court at Wimbledon. In the early years, rivalries were good-natured, wrapped up in sportsmanship and etiquette of the day. Times soon changed. Tennis, I think, is, is special in that it is single-arm combat. It's one against one, and it's, it's your technique against the other player's technique, but I think it's also your mental strength against the other player's mental strength and your ability to rise to the occasion when the occasion demands. It helps if they have contrasting styles, and if they're the two best players, all the better. And then what tends to happen is they keep raising the bar for each other. You really need that other player to push you. You need that benchmark. If, if you just go and win every match, people are going to say, yeah, but he wasn't. What did he do when he was pressed? He didn't have any competition. So ultimately, they're better for the existence of the other, because it sort of becomes this benchmark that gives their greatness some context. In the women's game, another rivalry was also flourishing. Five times Martina Navratilova and Chris Evert met in a Wimbledon final, and five times Navratilova came out on top, with Evert twice overcoming her rival in semi-finals. Like Borg and McEnroe, they were perfect foils, and like a good novel, a new chapter unfolded each high summer. With Chris, I felt like it was my match to win or my match to lose, like I was more in control. But still, Chris was so good and was not going to give you anything and you had to earn it. So I knew I had to really keep my cool and you know, keep it together because she was certainly not going to give it at all. Navratilova's fitness, determination and power would take the game to a new level in the 1980s. 
a nine singles title still a record to this day. She changed people's attitudes towards her in so many ways and conquered so many demons and won beautifully on this court playing in a style that I wish we'd saw more players playing today, the wonderful serve and volley style, but the emotion of her on, on centre court, it did something to her. Navratilova's dominance was challenged by Steffi Graf. But though the pair met in three successive finals, Graf winning two, the mantle had already passed on. Graf won seven titles, but never found a rival who could question her supremacy on centre court. In the second set of the 1980 final, Borg began to play like the champion once more. But McEnroe stood firm. Borg was in trouble at four all. He saved some break points. You felt like he was teetering on the, on the brink there a little bit. He did not want to spot McEnroe a two-set lead, but he managed to squeak the set out 7-5 after he could well have lost it 6-4. That was important. You know, there's a huge difference between one set all and two sets to love the other way, and both players knew it, and I think it pretty much carried Borg through the third set very comfortably. Now on level terms, Borg's experience on centre court began to show, taking the third set 6-3. If the 1980 final marked the start of a new era of celebrity, it also marked the beginning of the end of an era of artistry, guile and grace. Just five years later, a teenager from West Germany took the game by storm. When unseeded Boris Becker won the first of his three Wimbledon singles titles, he was just 17 years old, the youngest ever. But the clue to the real impact Becker made on the game came in his nickname, Boom Boom. Game and first game. And you see him now and you say, that was Boom Boom? This guy's not so big. But at the time, he had this sort of hulking physique and the big serve and the acrobatic volleys. And uh, in some ways, his game was tailored to Wimbledon. I think he filled young people with confidence that here was a kid, 17. I mean, let, you think of 17-year-olds nowadays. Could a 17-year-old now go out and win Wimbledon? I don't think so. Armed with one of a new generation of graphite rackets, Becker transformed the sport into the power game we see today. For him and tennis, there was no turning back. For close to a hundred years, players may do with wooden rackets strung with catgut. Newfangled designs came and went, but it was still about the craftsmen and not the tools. The global growth of the game brought new commercial opportunities for the racket manufacturers, and new materials were tried and tested. Jimmy Connors embraced a steel racket in the 70s whilst John McEnroe employed a composite version in the early 80s. But the quantum leap came soon after with the introduction of oversized graphite rackets and man-made strings. Stronger yet lighter and wielding a bigger sweet spot, players could hit harder and more freely there were big implications for the whole game, not least for Wimbledon, where the fast grass surface already favoured the power players. Something had to be done to maintain the balance between power and touch. The speed of the balls was reduced, and many believe the courts were slowed too. I think you asked the players, and the players will tell you that the court is definitely slower than it was 10 years ago. I've heard players say they think it's slower than the French. We've never tried to slow the courts down, but what we have done is changed the grasses over the years. And people have said that slowed the courts down. What's actually happened is it's made the bounce a little bit higher. So if the ball's coming through 
a little a few inches higher, then it gives the players more opportunity to retain it. The fact is that everybody now, because of the racket technology, plays the same on every surface. It's not just grass. When they come here to play the short grass court period of the year, they come with their strokes honed on hard court and clay court play. Whether it be the racket, strings, balls or the grass, a player's movement has changed drastically. From attacking the net a few years ago to counter-attacking from the baseline today. So good are ground strokes in the game that the volley has all but disappeared. A fact mourned by many. We've had Wimbledon finals where the winner hasn't gone to the net except to shake hands. And I, I think the sport really, um, you know, I, I think something's missing, something's deficient when you can win a major championship without hitting a volley. Equipment technology would significantly affect rivalries in the 1980s and 90s. Boris Becker and Stefan Edberg brought almost identical serve and volley games to centre court for three successive finals. Edberg edging out the trilogy two to one. Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi developed a worldwide rivalry which never reached its fulfillment at Wimbledon. Before the balls and supposedly the grass were slowed down, with the balance still too much in favour of the serve volleyer, Sampras prospered, winning Wimbledon a record seven times. Six games all. Quiet, please. The tie break now comes into operation. Two sets to one to Borg in the 1980 final. The fourth set would go into a tie break. The tie break. The greatest of all time. McEnroe continued to serve and volley superbly. But Borg's ground strokes were as precise as ever. Six five to Borg and match point to the Swede. However he got there, I don't know. It was just the beginning of a tie break that would continue to ebb and flow. I did feel like during that tiebreaker that it was becoming something that was going to be really special. It seemed like there was a lot of points that ended with winners and it just seemed like the crowd was really into it and it just had this magical moment that you don't feel that often. Championship point number four. Borg on match point during that tiebreaker lunged and fell on a backhand volley, of which he, had, if he had made that volley, he would have won the match and literally been 10 feet in front of me. And I would have been there with like my normal lens with the entire stadium and all the crowd reacting. And it would have been just in my face, but he misses the point. It was as if both men were feeding off each other, cajoling, pushing, lifting each other to new heights. For 20 minutes, Borg and McEnroe produced tennis of verve and artistry rarely seen even on centre court. Oh! Every other point was either set point or championship point. I mean, it would just go back and forth like that, and every point was won. These guys were playing fabulous tennis. It wasn't like anybody was choking. And I used to make notes on my pad that I'd devised for scoring, and uh, it was very difficult to keep track of all the match points and the set points that were coming and going. And uh, I would sort of press the the button to uh, 
cut the microphone and say, did I get that right? Was that the sixth match point? <laughs> This is the greatest match that's ever been played. And, you, and, you, and you're watching it. And you're right here. You know, my son, you're right here. And that tie break just goes on and on. And nobody loses any points. Every point is a winner. 15 all. McEnroe saved five match points to add to the two saved earlier in the set. Oh, unbelievable shot. While Borg saved six set points before McEnroe finally seized the moment. You just wondered how long the players could go on playing this extraordinary level of tennis, uh, until suddenly um, Borg missed a volley on set point. Yes, two sets all. You'd have thought the roof of Centre Court was going to blow off because the cheers for making it two sets all were just extraordinary. When it was over, I mean, I thought for sure there's no way I can lose now. You know, I thought the guy's got to let down. I mean, this is it now. Well, now this final has become an absolute classic. Deep inside, I thought definitely I'm going to lose this match. I was so disappointed and mad myself that how could, how could I lose this match? I was thinking that way, how can I lose this match, even if it was like one more set to play. Wimbledon has known other rivalries since. In the women's game, the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, are almost too close to share a court competitively. Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal have enjoyed three epic finals, the last of them at least as gripping as Borg and McEnroe, and possibly of greater quality from first to last. I think if you asked Roger Federer if he would be the player he is were it not for Nadal and asked Nadal the same question, they would both say no, they've needed each other to raise their game to higher peaks, and I think the same would be true of Navratilova and Evert, the same would be true of Borg and, and McEnroe. Each one required someone else to just help them go that extra stage further and be that little bit better. Perhaps because of the passing of time, a longing for a bygone age, nothing seems to eclipse the 1980 final. After losing the fourth set in such a dramatic way, many thought Borg was gone. Starting the fifth set, uh, I remember walking out to serve, and uh, I knew that it was crucial to hold serve first game in the fifth set. But still, I was thinking about the tiebreaker. But then it was more like it came that I could relax in a way, because I, s I didn't know what I was thinking about. I was just playing. And uh, funny enough, that was probably the most relaxing set I played of all the five sets. Such was the fortitude of the man that Borg would lose just two points on his serve the rest of the match. Seven games to six up, a record fifth straight victory was almost his. most iconic celebration in Wimbledon history. Even today, people uh, around the world, they remember the match. Uh, some people come up, you know, telling both me and John, you know, what a great tiebreaker. They have no idea who, who won the tiebreaker. They remember that we played a tiebreaker. And uh, that's, that's a nice match to remember, I think, both for me and John. Of course, someone's got to lose, but in a sense, I could look at my kids in the eye and say that uh, that made me a better player and a better person, and, and I was more respected as a tennis player because of that, the, the excitement that surrounded the tiebreaker, being part of one of the great matches in tennis history.
McEnroe would end Borg's reign a year later with the first of his three singles titles. Borg retired, aged 26, made one comeback and did not return to Wimbledon again until the Millennium celebrations on Centre Court. McEnroe, who was initially refused membership of the All England Club because of his behaviour, is no longer super brat. The 1980 final is a tribute to an era which saw some of Wimbledon's greatest rivalries and its most dominant players. Few thought the game on grass could be bettered so soon, but greatness cannot be confined so neatly to place and time. A brilliant new champion was just a heartbeat away.